Hello listeners, and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Fault. I'm your speaker Casey, and before we get started, I just wanted to say a massive welcome to my newest patron, Leanne. Welcome to our club, and I hope you enjoy the exclusive content. I am so thankful for your support, and I am excited to have you here with me. For the rest of this month, we will be exploring something I have covered many months ago, Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism is known for snake handling, faith healing, and speaking in tongues, and I have a number of guests who will explore with us their experiences in various branches of this faith. Today, we start with April, who was a member of the Assembly of God. So hi, April, and thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Um, you're somebody that I spoke to many months ago, so I'm excited to finally get the opportunity to sit down and um, have a nice lengthy discussion about some of your experiences. Would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and tell them a little bit about who you are? Okay. Um, well, I'm April. I'm 33. I, um, I live in Alaska, and... That's interesting, I guess, to some people. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, I work with, I don't have an interesting job. I'm sorry. It's, I work with like website computer stuff, like graphics. I will, sometimes say I'm a graphic designer, which sounds better, sounds fancier, but. <laughs> yeah, I think that sounds fun. I mean, <laughs> I suppose if it's something that you do every day, you probably don't find it interesting, but it's not something that I'm particularly good at. So I think that that is an interesting line of work. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty boring sometimes. It's it's not as creative as like it sounds sometimes, but sometimes it can be, you know, have fun art projects and stuff. Mixed so in. it's it is kind of here and there, you get the exciting mm-hmm. projects. Cool, cool. So we're here to talk today about your time in a movement called the Assembly of God. Can you give us a brief description of this religious movement and sort of their belief system and practices? I'm going to do my very best. I mean, I feel like you could look it up on Wikipedia and get like a full, you know, whatever. But basically, uh, it's a church. I never thought of it as weird because I grew up in it. I was like born basically going there and all my friends uh were in the church all the friends I was allowed to hang out with all the families that my family hung out with um they believe that the bible is 100% true no matter what um but they also like will tell you what it means so it's just like you know (laughs) I remember once I asked like what how do we know the bible's true and they were like well the bible says and I was just like so I could write a book and say like it's true and yeah anyway um they're also really big on like the holy spirit and uh the movements of the holy spirit the holy spirit being like in you living in you giving you the gift of tongues um she's just like gibberish that's spiritual i guess while music is playing seems cool um (laughs) this is the best explanation you're ever gonna get okay now um yeah, I don't know what else to say uh, about it. They believe in like, um, they believe gay people are going to hell. They believe that uh, Jesus is going to come back in the end times. And they believe in the rapture. Mm, you know, the, all the stuff. <laughs> okay, okay. So you mentioned that you were um, basically born into this um, yeah. religion. Uh, so did your parents both meet uh, as members of the Assembly of God? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, no. So my mom grew up Catholic, actually. And okay. my dad grew up maybe like going to church sometimes, like just, you know, maybe Easter or something like that, but um, was not really ever religious. And they met, got married and moved up to Alaska. And then my mom kind of found a church when I was a baby I think she, because like Alaska so you know they were both far away they're from the east coast so they're both far away from like a community of any sort and my mom was just like I need that with my kids yeah. and stuff. um but yeah I grew up my mom got super into it immediately she joined all the things she was in the choir she was in the you know clubs she was uh on the worship band 
Um, and so I ended up and my siblings ended up kind of going to church like every single day of the week just for like even if she had like a practice she needed to go to or a woman's group or something like that. Um, my dad, on the other hand, never, he was just honest with us. He's like, guys, when we die, we're just going to go in the ground and it's over. And we're just like weird that you believe that dad (laughs) like what that's so like wrong and you're going to hell according to my Sunday school teacher and that's scared um so it was a weird dynamic but yeah so that's answering that question (laughs) okay okay and uh you talked about having siblings in the church uh with you so how many brothers and sisters are we speaking yeah, so I have a brother and sister who are twins, and then my youngest sister, and I'm the oldest. Okay, so- and all of you would get sort of taken to each of these um, activities that your mom was involved with in the church? Yeah, and there was stuff for kids too. Um, you know, if uh, if the adults had a, a Bible study, they'd be like a kid's version of it in, in another room. Um, yeah, and my mom was just like hauling us four kids to everything um yeah yep so do you think it was that lack of community or 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 familiarity or closeness to people that she felt at home that she was trying to replace by joining all these activities and taking part in as much as she could yeah I think so um and I think also probably her catholic upbringing like you know it, maybe she had some issues with that and so she's like well another church like for me I grew up in in the AG church but I look at the Catholic church of like oh that's probably so much of a better experience even though they probably have like some of the similar trauma or whatever or some of the similar shame messages and stuff like that yeah but I wasn't in it so maybe it's something like that where she saw the other churches who didn't have to wear uniforms and like had fun or music and being like that's the church I want to have my kids grow up in or something. Okay. But she also, had her own, she was coming from trauma a little bit of her own like life. Um, her mom had, had died. And so I think she, that was also part of it. Like if I could just find a good place with that's that I can call good and not have to worry about the morality of it, I think, and like get invested in it and get my family invested in it yeah yeah I mean that's that seems to that seems to make sense to somebody that may be experiencing a level of um spiritual difficulty um you know finding a place of acceptance yeah you're in Alaska and it's the winter Mm -hmm. months so are you in that weird period at the moment where it's just like really dark all the time so like we just had daylight savings so um here where we always get kind of mad about it because we're like we already don't have enough light like you're taking it from us um it just snowed today so for the first time well sort of it looks like it's gonna stay like you know how it'll maybe you don't you know how to snow and then it'll melt (laughs) yeah 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 um so that's exciting and yeah it's it's not too bright out yet and it's our it's like what 10 30 so yeah it's still the sun's still thinking about maybe showing up (laughs) okay cool 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 (laughs) and uh when you speak about there being activities available for other children were there lots of other children and families that were like that you became close to and familiar with uh that you would see on a regular basis yeah so there was like basically like a core group of us where we were all like the, the kids and running around while our parents were playing their instruments or had to go to the early practices or had to stay for like first, second and third service and then wow. come back for the service. And so we all, because we're just like hanging out in the halls all the time or like in the same Sunday school classes all the time, you know, we were just a big group of kids and we got to spend the night at each other's houses and all of that. And I wasn't allowed to like be friends in the same way with kids I went to school with because I went to public school and my mom was like no like their parents might like rape you or something but parents at the church like they're good so like we don't have to worry about that and like I would be able to spend the night at their house which is not you know true it's not maybe the way to decide that but I didn't get raped for the record (laughs) 
No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, so when where, while you attended public school, mm-hmm. do you feel like you had a different experience to typical uh, children who maybe di- who didn't follow religion as closely? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I felt, uh, um, like everybody kind of knows something that I don't know because I was still sheltered because they were allowed to watch t- the TV that I wasn't allowed to watch and movies. Like it was like you know, they say like pop culture, things we all experience together and like remember it and like have the same inside jokes about it and all of that. But like, I'm in that, but not at the same time. And I was always like, is that some, do I not understand that? Because there's more people in the room who also don't understand that. Or is, am I the only one in the room who didn't know who like Justin Timberlake was, you know, like I was always trying to gauge that. Right. And and try to still fit in and not be like you loser (laughs) you didn't know what we're talking about yeah so there were a Uh, few experiences where you felt maybe ostracized from the rest of your peer group definitely all the time I felt like I was having to pretend that I wasn't as sheltered as I was and um yeah to like to this day, I feel like I'm just like, I wish I, you know, could relate, you know, because that, you know, that nowadays they're like, if you're 33, you know, this or whatever. And it's like, damn it, I don't know it. (laughs) Or like, not me though, because I grew up in the church and my mom said, no, you can only watch PBS. (laughs) And did you have any friends in public school outside of the church that you're, that you maybe didn't mention too much to your parents? I mean, I had friends that I just saw at school, but I, I, like, they really, my mom didn't let, my my dad wouldn't have cared, but my mom just didn't let us, like, really hang out with anybody that she didn't trust their parents 100%. Right. And that just happened to be default anyone outside of the church. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> How many people on average do you think were in your congregation altogether? Um... In a couple hundred, I feel like That's, it was a pretty good sized church. And was it uh, led by sort of one pastor or priest or? Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was a pastor who was, who was the lead pastor and still is at that church um, my entire life. Um, yes. <laughs> that Assembly of God. Is that sort of like a local a countrywide movement or or is it or is it global it is countrywide I'm pretty sure it started in California um like you know like a revival okay so they had some kind of like holy spirit movement revival and then they started it there and then it kind of spread and it's it's all across the country or across the world there uh assembly of god missionaries that get sent out there's assembly of god churches we have here in Alaska I I don't know at least 10 which is like I mean we're not very we're not a highly populated state so you know there's a lot um yeah and Uh, you mentioned something about mission trips as well um just talk us through what a mission trip is and, and and what that would entail Sure, sure. A missions tri- a missions trip is where you go in a group to another place, and you're supposed to evangelize. Oh, that's another thing about the, uh, the AG Church. They're into evangelism. They're like, okay. we know the truth, and you don't, and we're gonna we need to tell you. Um, yeah, and you just so what we would do is we would find maybe another church in the area so it's like it never made sense to me it's like they already have a church here but okay we'll go there we'll partner with that church and we would do like maybe uh, an event at a community center where we're doing like skits or songs or giving out free food or um, even just preaching and inviting the town to come see us preach and then we'll we pray for them and we hope that we get them saved and we're really proud of ourselves if somebody does get saved we're like yeah we got one um 
yeah, that's basically what a mission trip is. It's kind of like a little vacation to a place where you don't live and you just assume everyone there needs your help and you try to help them. So, which I thought growing up was like, you know, good. And I was like, we're really doing something, you know? Um, never did I ever think like, hey, if I grew up in that culture, like I would believe completely differently and I would be just as like sure that I was right. And, you know, like the, it's just so crazy to me that that was never something that occurred to me. Like when I, if I go to Mexico, like maybe those Mexican people like have their own culture and their own beliefs and that's okay. And if I had grown up that way, I would not believe the way I do now. And like, what does that mean for how I believe? I don't know. You know? Yeah, it's interesting. I suppose when you grow up in such a um, like a closed circuit, to yeah. recognize and realize that there are there is an abundance of culture and and different religions and and spirituality um, accessible um, until you go out and find those things. And I imagine it's really overwhelming to have that first experience where you're like, oh, I didn't realize that there was so many different interpretations of just the Bible. Right, um, right. Which is interesting enough. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that if you can hear any banging or anything, um, that it, it's uh, it's no, early November here. Um, so for anyone who knows about um, England uh, on the 5th of November, uh, we celebrate this thing called Bonfire Night, uh, where Guy Fawkes tried to blow up Parliament by putting loads of explosives underneath the uh, Parliament building. Um, and then every year there's a big bonfire and people throw like um, scarecrows of Guy Fawkes on the fire and burn them alive to, to celebrate um, not trying to bring down the government. Um, so people let off lots of fireworks and they are constant. So I do apologise to anyone that can hear lots of banging in the background. Um, the 5th of November was actually yesterday, but people, I think, during this second lockdown are just a bit... Uh, yeah. excited to have fireworks in that, their own back garden that V for Vendetta movie is that yes. what, oh, okay I was yeah kidding. yeah <laughs> so uh, I just wanted to make a quick I thought they died down but I can hear them outside at the moment so uh, <laughs> um you, you you mentioned um um evangelism as part yeah. of the uh, assembly of God uh, movement were you ever encouraged to evangelize in your school uh, for sure oh yeah oh yeah um and I felt shame about it because I'm kind of an introvert um and you know we were encouraged to like you know guys like pray loudly at lunch for your for your lunch that that's the least you could do you're not going up to anybody and asking them where they're gonna go when they die you're not like telling them the gospel all you're doing is like praying loudly and you have the right to do that and that can be a witness and I would always be like, every time I'd be like, I'm just going to pray myself. I'm not bold enough to pray loudly because it's weird. But like, they're just like, be weird for Jesus, you guys. It's going to make a difference. You could change someone's life. Someone could like decide to get saved just from seeing you pray. And then it just got more, more than that. Like do a headstand next to you. This is so silly, but this is absolutely anybody who grew up in this church would be like, yes, my youth pastor told me that do a headstand next to the vending machine. And when somebody asks you why you're doing it, say I'm doing it for Jesus and then tell them about Jesus. Literally. <laughs> That's very strange, isn't it? Especially yeah. because you, you already mentioned feeling slightly ostracized for the rest of your peer group. And then you're being encouraged to go and overtly do very bizarre things that yep. might come across as strange to other people in your, in your year group. And they'd always have these stories, like Christian magazines, I feel like would say this stuff too. Like I did a headstand by the vending machine and five people got saved or whatever. <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and like, you know, stand on the table at lunch and wait till a security guard takes you down because that's what Jesus would do. He was a rebel and he like, whatever, you know, you have, you can, you can make a difference by doing these things and having the faith to like be bold and stuff. And I would always be like, I can't even, oh, there's also like a line that would say a lot, like, if I were to go into your school and like 
ask the person who you sit next to in science class, like, if she, is she a Christian? Like, would they know? Would they know if she was a Christian? And like, I would feel so much shame. I'd be like, I don't think they would. Like, they'd be like, they'd be like, I think her name's April, you know, like, I don't, cause I wasn't talking to people even about anything else. I was just like, I'm shy. I'm sleeping in my classes. I don't care about science class. <laughs> um, yeah. So it was, that was definitely encouraged. Yes. <laughs> so when you okay. were growing yes. up in the church, were there any <laughs> restrictions that were sort of, um, encouraged in terms of your diet or clothing at all uh yeah definitely clothing like very modest uh don't show like if we went to like a swimming party or something like a or a, out to a lake even like don't wear a swimsuit like wear clothes if you're a girl and you wear a white shirt over your swimsuit like you're basically asking for it like how dare you? You can't get in the water. Like that's a, a move that you know better, you know, like, which is crazy now, like, so, cause some girls would show up and they just wouldn't think about it or something and they would get in trouble and the boys wouldn't really, they're just taking their shirts off and jumping in and that's no problem. But like, um, yeah, don't ever show cleavage. Don't ever show like your stomach. Don't like, if your shirt rides up when you bend down, like worry about that. Um, definitely all of that was taught to us like modesty 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 so important because you might turn a guy on accidentally and like we don't want that <laughs> and that like that's like that's your weird. problem to worry about though it well it was taught to us that it was because their brains work differently than ours and so we need to be we need to protect each other and like they're going to protect us from like a grizzly bear and we're going to protect them from their own penis I guess I don't know <laughs> like what no but also um swearing you know that's not that's frowned upon you know, don't even say oh my god that's where we get all these like garsh and you know goodness and all of that people say um which is so silly like just say it <laughs> like you mean the same thing basically what the heck um but yeah uh what else drinking that's bad drugs obviously <laughs> um yeah those are the basics I think okay and it's encouraged obviously to um not engage in sexual intercourse before marriage and and those types of doctrines I over that one um oh definitely yeah definitely um yeah that's a big one like uh my best friend and her husband did not kiss before they were on their wedding day <laughs> um they were like we're doing it for jesus and yeah it's a purity is like this huge toxic thing that we're definitely taught like our whole and it's so so important and I remember even being like this is something I really need to worry about because my mom had married like from what I knew at a young age like that my dad wasn't saved and my mom was and so I was like this is something that you can like accidentally you know do like you can marry somebody who's like not a Christian and like bad for you or whatever and bad for your family and like internally evil. <laughs> and so I was like, so worried. I was like always vetting every guy that I ever met and being like, is he husband material? Like starting in like second grade. And then am I like being a princess enough for him to like want to choose me when it time comes and like something I really concerned myself with and prayed all the time. Wow. Of my future husband and my and his purity and like God right now if he's you know considering watching porn stop him like whoever he is yeah just crazy the did you ever meet anybody you thought might be um a, a, a suitable for you whilst you were in the church um I, I had crushes on on people for sure um 
I, I didn't really date because again, I was very sheltered. And also I was really, really good at like, another thing was like, guard your heart. So like, don't let your heart, don't like start being like, have romantic feelings for somebody like before it's time for you, like the romantic part of your life to be like awakened. And so like really guard yourself. And I was just really good at doing that. So I was, I'm like, just in general, I think as a personality, I can, I come across kind of guarded and uh, a little less, I don't know, available. I don't know. So like, I think I was just really good at being like, there's a shield here. There's a wall here. You can't get through. So even when I had crushes, like nobody knew I wasn't obvious about, I was really like, I have a crush and I'm shutting it down, but I'm going to like, look at him one time and maybe he'll know. And like, just like no game, no. (laughs) So like, yeah, nothing really ever happened um, in the church with anybody okay. out <clears throat> and you sessions and journal <laughs> you mentioned earlier on as well about um how homosexuality was seen mm-hmm. as a sin within the church um did you know anybody in your congregation that associated themselves with the lgbtqia community thank you for saying that um okay we actually did have like a lesbian couple who were like trying to quit, I guess, according to us, um, according to the gossip, I suppose. And that we were all like, ooh, because they were like two ladies who had short hair and we were all like, oh my gosh, scandalous. I hope that they like, I I mean, at least we can be glad that they're here and they're trying to like give their sin to God. And I do remember that. Um, But yeah, if anybody was gay, they did not talk about it. They did not, if anybody was having... It was on the DL, like maybe tell like a a youth leader and be like, I'm having these thoughts. And then the youth leader be like, I'm so like going to pray for you. And I'm worried about your salvation. And like, that's, uh, we were definitely taught it was like a perversion and a temptation from the devil. And if you were having something like that, it, you know, it's basically the same as having like sexual thoughts about your dad or something like, you know, like it's just the same as kind of perversion is that um it's just interesting I I often ask this question because um I wonder how many people feel as though they have to live uh not as their authentic selves uh because of these controlling environments that they are in living as living as though they are impure and don't deserve happiness because they can't change the way they think or feel about uh, certain people and I think that's just so oppressive in this day and age and it's really hard for me to get my head around um, and I, I don't understand how people can say that they're doing the work of God when um, congregants must feel so ashamed of themselves and unhappy uh, it's just really sad, isn't it? It's just, it's, it's just, it's really difficult for me to comprehend, I suppose. Yeah, it, it's, it, I love that you're having a hard time with it because like, uh, I, it was just like, what was taught to me is absolutely true. And just like, I remember watching um, Billy on the street. Do you know that show? I don't and, like, know. Okay. So he's just, he's like l- loud and proud. Um just a gay actor guy who like does it's a really fun show it's on Netflix you just check it out I'm recommending it okay um but he, I just remember watching it and being like he's gay but he like it seems like such a delight and has like love in his heart for people and just like it seems like a really fun and I was just like really he's going to hell like why I don't know like what did he do I don't know like is it that bad I don't like I just remember really thinking about that because I even for the time was like it was so taught to me even when I had started like branching out from the church and like not attending as much and like questioning my faith more and stuff I was like but gay people are still wrong like that's unnatural or like like that was what I was taught and like the verses are so clear about it like the verses actually aren't now like you um they're making a documentary. I don't know when it's coming out, but it's basically like they added that into the Bible in like the eighties. Do you know about that? No, but I have been uh, told about certain bits of scripture 
um, how it is actually written and then how it is interpreted uh, by by certain movements. Yeah. So the, yeah, they interpreted it in the 80s to be like gay people are like going against God and like perverted and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. When it was, I guess, initially um, like pedophiles and like they changed the word to be like homosexuality. So yeah, which is really, I mean, <laughs> That's a whole nother can of worms that because there is so much abuse that goes on in churches all over the world in terms of child sex abuse and pedophiles in positions of power that use them positions to abuse young boys and girls. Yeah. So how damaging is it to change that rhetoric to apply to a community group of people who are not hurting people just to have control over that group of people as opposed to not changing how words are written to protect children and their innocence and stop people in positions of power being able to um do these things I don't know it's a whole nother especially when you think about the catholic church and all that stuff it's like it's a whole nother can of worms but um it's definitely yeah I don't want to go too much into that's like a whole nother episode um but um, you you mentioned briefly that you um, didn't get involved with any of the boys in your congregation, but there was a night um, that you were pulled aside for and um, berated um, around the age of 18. I didn't know if you just wanted to tell the, the listeners a little bit about that experience. Sure. I mean, that's how serious it is. Like my best friend and I, we were graduated. We were in college. We were living in an apartment together and we had these friends who were also our same age. They had an apartment, but in another city. Um, That's actually an eight hour drive from where we live. And um, so like all the Assembly of God churches in the whole state would like do these camps. And so we would meet people from all around the state and like become friends with them, become like MySpace friends with them or exchange numbers and whatever. And we were like, oh, it'd be fun. Like (laughs) over like the Thanksgiving break, we'll like drive up and we'll see when you guys can show show us your town and everything. And they had like cleared out their entire like upstairs of their little apartment space to us so that it was like super pure and like they we were all like afraid of sin you know (laughs) so like we were not gonna mess around and we just like went up there and we like played video games all night and then we slept over and then we all went to McDonald's in the morning or whatever and like it was super innocent and we got home we found out that like people were my best friend's mom and like other people in the church were like where were you you were at a boy's house overnight like for a, more than one day, like the, like the, just the thought that, that anything could have been seen as them here was like, we were in trouble and we were like told that we were wrong. And they, I think they were going to come down and visit us the next week, but they also got in trouble. And so they never did. And we were like, okay, we can't even like have friends, I guess. Like, it's so serious. And what would be the type of discipline for those those types of um, sins, so to speak? I mean, if we if we slept with somebody or just like the nonsense. That we did. Yeah. What was the what was the fallout for you when you went back to church? Did you have to disclose anything to anyone? Were you expected um, to um, uh, no, um, was, repent? Like, it's like shaming us and I I think we at the time were like we didn't do anything wrong so like we're not gonna repent but definitely there's my my best friend and I would have a lot of discussions and I think just all through high school and everything like always talking about like check your heart and see if there's anything that you need to repent for um or or say is a sin I remember once um, we were watching a movie and (laughs) we thought, oh no, it has like something in it that we didn't know, something like bad. And so we like threw the movie on the ground in the case and we called her mom 
And we were like, can you take this back to Blockbuster for us? Because we don't want to touch it because we're like, it has like sin on it. And we've already like exposed ourselves to it, which is like so weird. But her mom was like so proud of us. She was like, you girls are so like spiritual and just trying your best. And we were like, we really are. So obviously you, you were genuinely scared when you were younger of um, oh. the repercussions of, of, of watching things or taking part in things that you were told were not good for you. Yeah, yeah, like de definitely because, you know, I'm growing up and all of these adults are around me all the time saying like, this is true, this is correct, this is right, this is, you know, 100%, like, it's crazy now. I think of myself in my 30s, like, if I, would I never tell my little niece, like, her dad's going to hell in such a, like, absolute way, you know, like, as if I know anything about the world. I don't, like, <laughs> just, like, the, the confidence, I guess, that they had, I, like, is shocking to me, like, that they're telling small children, this is absolutely true, and this is absolutely not true, like, and this is what you need to know and this is how you need to live and this is so important and if you don't like it's detrimental mm -hmm. um we actually had this skit that we did every year that our whole church would put on um and it's it actually is a st thing that still happens still goes around traveling um it's called heaven's gates and hell's flames and it's like you it's, it's there's heaven and then there's hell on the stage okay on the sanctuary platform and uh, two people or a group of people will walk out and they'll do like their little lines and they'll be like did did you uh want to try drugs or something <laughs> and then they like try drugs and then they like die and then one of them is like a secret christian and they get to go to heaven and the other ones are like being dragged to hell by demons and they're like screaming to their friend and they're like janice why didn't you tell me about the book of life? And they're like getting dragged to hell because their friend never witnessed to them in life. And like that shit, we watch that every year. Uh, little skits like that. There was one where a girl commits suicide and then she goes to hell and like, if only I had known. Because that was also a belief wow. that suicide, you go straight to hell. And that's also like a huge issue with like mental health and the church. That is um, scare tactics, isn't it? I mean, it, that first skit that you just talked about, everybody is, everybody is, is receiving the bad end, aren't they? I mean, the friends go into heaven, but then they're like, if only you would have been a better friend. Yeah. But, and then the other one's like, the message is like, be a good friend and save your other friend from hell. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's uh, that must be traumatizing to watch as a child. It didn't seem it at the time. It seemed normal and good. And we invited people to it like for the whole month beforehand and we just hoped that our friends would come and hear the message and get saved and learn that they if they didn't, that they would go to hell and how important it was for oh, them. That is that's heavy. Yeah, they, oh, yeah, that's the church I grew up in. I mean, when you when you were would go out and encourage um, you know people to come by and and, and watch, mm -hmm. were you were you ever um, uh, did you ever fundraise for your church or did you ever recruit new members? Um, I we did do fundraisers usually for missions trips so we can make money to fly somewhere and put on. That, a skit similar to that <laughs> basically um like car washes I don't know bake sales whatever raffle tickets to an event uh 
sponsor me while I stay up all night, something silly, silly stuff. Um, yeah, did I ever recruit anybody? I, I mean, I didn't really, <laughs> cause I was just not, but I did have a friend in high school and she, my other, so I had another friend who was a Christian also. And I knew she was a Christian and she would like read her Bible on the bus every day. And I would be like embarrassed to be like, she's such a loser. Even, but I also felt like I should be reading my Bible on the bus. Like I'm not as brave as her. So she invited our third friend to, to a, 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 like a youth conference thing. And that third friend got saved and she came to church the next week and she had brought like a garbage bag of like all of her sinful, like Eminem CDs and like movies that were rated R and like she brought it and she put it in the sin bin, which is <laughs> a trash can that just says like the sin bin on it that they would, you could like bring your sinful items and then the, the church would like take care of them for you and like burn them because they're like having like a demonic hold in your life basically is the belief. This seems crazy when I say it out loud. Okay. But I remember being like so proud that this girl that I knew, even though I wasn't the one to save her, that she was like changing her life. And that that was such like an amazing thing to me. I don't know. And yeah, I I mean, uh, it sounds like uh, the sin bin was full of um, almost potentially very um very interesting items that could get you some money if you were to sell them on second hand oh for sure yeah um yeah <laughs> do you think that you would class the assembly of god as mostly a patriarchal uh, church yes but not as bad as other churches like i had a children's pastor growing up who was a woman they did let women speak. Um, they didn't force women to like wear this all the time or not cut their hair. Like they were pretty chill about those things. And there was definitely like the man is in charge. And you, if you're a woman, you need like a spiritual leader and he, he makes the decisions. And if you hear from God, then like wait for him to also hear from God. And like, if you agree, then, you know, like don't tell your man what, to do or what God's saying because he's the leader um and like how God put men over women to protect them Mm. and that's that's definitely the stuff we were taught but I've definitely heard of churches that were much more strict about it than the church I grew up in personally and maybe there are other AG churches who are a little more also get in your place woman (laughs) but um and um, you mentioned that there was some propaganda that was used by um, the AG church occasionally. Um, uh, some of it f- is focused around anti-abortion materials. Uh, mm. And I was just wondering if you know of anybody that's ever had to access that type of medical um, procedure before. Um, I mean, yes, yeah. I, and was it during the time that you were in the AG? Because I just wonder how that would challenge somebody's belief system. I mean, well, what happens and what happened to my friend um, is that she got pregnant, but it's worse to get pregnant before you're married, really, uh, than to have this secret, basically. And that's the choice that she made. Um and she didn't tell anybody about it and she got she was accepted by everybody you know everybody was like good job you waited till you were married to have sex like they nobody knew and so she married her husband and everything seemed cool and my other friend um got pregnant kept her baby and she was super judged she was walking through the church with a huge belly and uh, she was 19 and they all were like you sinned and we all know it and like the shame of that like if we care about life like let's embrace women who are pregnant before they're married you know instead of like shaming them for their choice they've made to like sin in your eyes or I don't know but yeah definitely 
that's a really abortion's a really big thing. It's it's may, like maybe the main reason why a lot of Christians still will vote for Trump um, or did vote for Trump because if you're Republican, then you're against abortion, and that's like a huge issue for the church. They believe abortion is murder, and they tell you from the pulpit. Um, and a lot of churches and a lot of AG churches are will say vote Republican and like say that from the pulpit and not be shy to say that, not feel weird about it. They think that's the godly choice, um, mainly because of abortion, but also a little bit because of gay marriage. And those are the main ones. Um, I think it's difficult, isn't it? Because your first friend that you spoke about, um, she would never have had to go through the shaming and the shunning that your second friend went through. But I imagine that there is deep psychological um emotions entrenched in having to go through such a procedure and then to keep it to yourself and not be able to share it with anybody um that must be um in itself a traumatic experience um you know I that there could be grief that goes along with that yeah definitely um I mean she's like married and has kids now and she's like doing great and whatever but yeah she doesn't I don't think she really likes to talk about that that happened and yeah the way that she had to go through that alone definitely something I think about a lot yeah and then your second friend who decided not to have that experience um is is then you know labeled as a sinner and talked about and um shamed and probably feels you know like an outcast in her own congregation and probably almost feels like her baby is being judged mm-hmm. before it's even born. Um, and that the baby itself, even though the baby is born without having made that decision itself, you know, is, is born with prejudice and sin attached to it because she's had this baby outside of marriage, which must be so sad for a mother to have to think about and experience. And then that makes me think about the unification church and those types of religious movements who say that we're all born of sin because of Adam and Eve and, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and the sin that they committed. So, and we can't help being born of sin because of things that other people have done, but how is that, how are you ever supposed to, like, that's just not fair. You're already, you're already starting on the back leg if that's the case we were taught that we were born with sin and like the example was like look at a toddler and like tantrums and stuff like that's sin and they don't know better and that's why they have to eventually like ask Jesus into their life um and there's like the age of accountability which is like whatever varying on whatever you believe or different for every person I guess is what some people would say and yeah that's and I remember just being like that makes sense yeah toddlers have tantrums so yeah that's sin I guess I was born with sin not I'm a sinner it just starts out very young with like there's something wrong with me and like I need to work on that and I can't even control it really but I need to like be aware of it and like try to do my best in spite of it and at what age were you when you decided to leave the church officially? Yeah. I mean, I have lots of friends who don't even know that I believe what I do now, like, or that I'm not as like Christian as I once was. Um, so that's a question. <laughs> um, re- I mean, really, maybe like three years ago which like it's it's just kind of a slow process where I had questions but I didn't let myself ask them really or I would like ask them to a certain extent and then I'd be like well you know maybe I'll find that out when I get to heaven doesn't make sense to me that like God thinks this or that God we are taught this in the church or whatever that I feel this way but I'm seeing this experience um but you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I would just shut it down and like close my journal or whatever and like kind of move on. And, um, I started listening to podcasts that would kind of unpack some of these things and it made it feel like you have permission to like ask these questions and, 
um, that's okay that you think that you're not the only one. And here's maybe another way to think about that. And it kind of like went from there of like, oh, maybe I can think about God in a this way. And like, maybe this way, or maybe God's not the God that I learned about growing up at all. And maybe there is no God. I don't know. Like, <laughs> you know, like, so um, that's kind of the, the little baby steps I took over y- years um, to eventually, I would probably call myself agnostic now, just because that seems like we don't really know. And I like to just kind of talk about the universe, like the universe unlocked this for me or whatever. Like that feels like a pretty chill way to explain things that maybe seem, but maybe before I would have been like, it was God's prophetic hand on my life and like be really intense about like how spiritual things were happening in my everyday life, which is also another super privilegey thing of like, I feel like we hear Christians all the time being like, they were out of like my favorite uh, detergent at Walmart. And then I went home and somebody brought me detergent and it's like, thank you, Jesus. Like, no, Jesus doesn't care about your fucking detergent. If he was going to do stuff like that, like, don't you think you'd be like saving lives? Like what, you know? So it's just really ignorant now that I think about it. (laughs) So when you started having doubts and, and decided to move away from the church, did you ever have a discussion about this with your mom? No. <laughs> I haven't told my parents. I haven't told my siblings. Um, lots of people do not know at all. I have like four friends that I'm honest with about. I mean, maybe maybe more than that. There's a handful of people that I'm, I'm I will talk about it with. I have one friend that I'm I'm really close with, but she, she and I were like best friends, childhood friends in, in the church I grew up in. And then she moved to another city. So she lives like four hours away from me, but we are both kind of going through this together. And so we'll talk a lot and be like, remember in third grade when this happened and she's like, that was messed up. And I'm like, that was messed up. Here's how it affected us. And we'll kind of like unpack stuff together. So that's nice. But that's like kind of why you found me on Reddit. Like I don't have an, a major outlet of like talking to, honestly about this, but yeah, I mean, I just journal a lot. I try to unpack and untangle myself from like weird purity messages um, that I'm, you know, still <laughs> figuring out. Is that and the- why? Uh, why do you think you've decided not not to speak to your mom about it? Is it because you're worried uh, of of how she will? see you or are you worried about how much stress that might put on her because she'd be worried about you not being saved so I don't think she would work so she's not really super in the church anymore I'm just not really close to family like (laughs) we're not one of those like tell each other everything kind of talk every day families we're like oh I haven't seen you for three months should we get together should I remember what my nephew looks like for a second even though you live like five minutes away from me. Um, Yeah. And I I just, it just seems like the drama of like having the honest conversation, I guess. And like having like a real conversation with my mom about something like this. I don't know. I just, I'm not interested in doing No, You don't (laughs) feel like one day you might challenge her on her faith? I mean, I know. I don't think she would really, I really don't think my family would care that much at this point um, because my mom doesn't go to that church anymore. She, she's older now. She's just like trying to li- like live her life, whatever. Like she's not as religious or cares that much about it as, as much as when we were kids. Maybe she's gone to therapy. I don't, I don't know. Um, again, I'm, I'm not as close with like, I know some people are like close with their families and they see my situation and they're like, that's weird. But <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, mostly it just seems like a can of worms and like just a, maybe like just energy that it would take to kind of like really April, like let's talk, I don't know, like question, I don't know. I just, 
it says hasn't come up hasn't been important yeah. no, I understand exactly I understand exactly okay. what you're saying um yeah <laughs> so the assembly of God is a um is a denomination of Pentecostalism yeah. is that right thank you yes yes so when you spoke about um being in the spirit and um and speaking in tongues did you ever personally experience or or as mm. others have told me feign to experience I know. either of those things happening to you so that's a great question I um again felt a lot of shame about this for a lot of my life um because I didn't have the gift of tongues. I didn't know other people were faking it. I didn't, I just was like, these adults, these people around me are telling me this is a thing that can happen to me and that it's gonna happen. So I've, I've been to tons of altar calls and camps and pre preachers being like, okay, I'm gonna count to three and then I'm gonna yell fire. And when I yell fire, everyone who prayed that they are gonna get the gift of tongues is gonna get it right then. And that would happen and I would be like, okay. And I'm like, nothing would happen. And then they'd say like, listen, you have to like, God's not going to come down and like wiggle your tongue for you. And I'm just like, I don't understand because like it, my, I'm very logical. So I'm just like, if I try to say anything, I'm going to say it in the language I know. So what do you want me to do? If I'm, am I like, I'm not supposed to talk my own language, but I, I should wiggle my tongue. I don't know what you want me to do. Like, but yeah, people were just wiggling their tongue, apparently. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, but this is what happened. And this like was something I had to unpack for a little bit because I, I still, I don't know. So my finally my senior year, and I'd been like to so many altar calls and so many, like everybody in the youth group was like, she needs it. Like, she doesn't have it still. We do, but she, that girl doesn't. <laughs> like, it was just like known that I just didn't have this gift. And I was just like, okay. I've been praying for it. Like I'm supposed, to, I'm supposed to like ask and receive, right? That's what I've been taught. Why isn't it happening? So um, this guest speaker was at our church and he again was like, if you don't speak in tongues, come to the front. So I did. And he whispered in my, he went down in my ear and he was like, repeat after me. You he was like, you already have the gift of tongues. I know it. So just repeat after me. And he started speaking tongues in my ear. And so I was trying to say what he was saying. Like I was trying to be like, -ba -da -ba -da -ba -da, whatever the heck. Okay. And he was like, he stopped. And then he was like, you're not repeating after me. You're actually saying your own tongue. Ugh, and I, okay. like, oh. I, I was like, oh my goodness. Thank like I did. Like, I was like so proud of that. And then I was like able to like do that without him. Like at the next time I was at like a prayer meeting and they were like speaking tongues I was like so proud I was like I can do it and I just did like whatever gibberish but I was really just literally speaking gibberish and being told that it was like something because it's not because like so some say that you're actually speaking like another language but you just don't know how exactly to speak it but if you were to go to like Zimbabwe or whatever I don't know like then you might find like a small rural rural village who like speaks exactly what your tongue is and it's like supernatural and God has given you like a language you just don't know you have but then there's also people who think like it's a heavenly language so like when you get to heaven you use it and it's a language actually in heaven and it's like powerful and spiritual and like holy and whatever and so that's why people really believe in speaking in tongues because they're like, I'm sick. I don't know what I'm saying, but I know what I'm saying is like, uh, of God. And like, it's perfect. It's like the perfect prayer. It's so, strange yeah. though. I can't imagine standing in a room speaking gibberish, knowing that I'm speaking gibberish and looking around the room and being like, you all know yeah. that we all know, we all know that, <laughs> that we we're all faking it. Yeah, but I didn't know. I like literally thought something happened. I was like, God gave me this gibberish and I don't understand it, but I'm going to say it in faith. Like I literally thought it was so special because of how, because of like my journey of like asking, 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 not getting it. And then finally that trying to repeat after some guy who's like, just being like shooby dooby in my ear. <laughs> Sorry, but like, um, and thinking like, fuck like something happened <laughs> like <laughs> um yeah and so 
I feel like even like why while I was like coming out of like being a Christian and like being like, I think this is all fake. I still was like looking at that moment and being like, but I think that was maybe supernatural. Like, I don't know. Cause I had labeled it so strongly as that when it happened. Um, but now I'm like, you know what? I don't know if it was as supernatural as all that. <laughs> like, I think and what about just- falling in the spirit? Is that ever something that you experienced? No. See, cause again, so logical. So like, I remember one time there was this guy, (laughs) we all stood in a line and he was like touching their heads, like fire, 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 fire. And he was like, and they were all falling and he got to me and I didn't fall. (laughs) And he like, like looked at me like bitch falling. (laughs) That happened to me so many times too. Like, I just was like, I just believed it was true. So I just like, why am I going to fall if I'm not really like overcome with the need to fall? I guess like, I just, like I'm not gonna move my tongue if like I didn't get a a word I don't know like yeah just too logical for the faith and that's why I think it was such a struggle for me to like ask all these questions but just also feel not allowed to ask them and like that was in one of your your questions to me about being brainwashed um like and I just never I I used to like joke like oh yeah I was brainwashed just in the sense of like, because I was so like saturated and people telling me things over and over and over again. But then I was really thinking about like all the Bible stories that were ever taught are like, shut off your brain and just have faith. And like the, that being such a theme of like every single Bible story, like the snake like convinced Eve to eat the apple and made like points and said like you should do this because of a good thing and she was like that's logical to me and so she did it and then she got punished and like anytime anybody had like a logical thought like oh we'll fight Jericho using weapons and it's like no stupid you're gonna walk in circles and play instruments like that's how you're gonna defeat it not logic like how dare you think in a practical way and that's like you know, like D- Daniel and the lion's den. It's like, he's going to get eaten. Like, no, that's logic. Shut that down. Pray, you know, like, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No free I, thinking, no free thought. Yes. And I just, I, I never real put that together until you asked me that. I was like, that's, it's literally the theme of like every Bible story that I was taught growing up over and over. And that preachers did like still preach about today using that same thing like don't try to use your brain and that was always like something I had to constantly shut down because I was such like a naturally like practical kind of a person Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what do you think your life has been like since you've distanced yourself from the church (gasps) yes thank you I feel genuinely, okay, this is crazy because, like, again, being taught my entire life, like, this is real freedom. Like, people who aren't saved don't know what real freedom and real love is because they're away from God, and God is the only way we can get love. He's He's the definition of love, and he's the only, like, giver of true, like, truth and freedom and life. Um, and so when I, like, let go, I felt, like, absolutely free and like I felt like a capacity to like love myself and like love other people and I didn't even realize how much energy I was taking up in my mind all the time to kind of like filter everything that I was experiencing and seeing and hearing people say through like is this Christian is this good is this you know I was doing that constantly because I was being taught that was so important to do and to let go of that, I was like, oh, I can just accept people for the first time ever. I, and that's so, like, it blew my mind that that, how, like, awesome that was. Um, like, it's crazy because it's like the church is really teaching you, like, judge people all the time and, like, worry about them. And that's why we're seeing people who, like, struggle with, like, these hate ideas and stuff because that's the church is doing that even if they say they're not yeah it's it always strikes me as interesting especially when it comes to like modesty um you know you have to be as pure on the outside as you are on the inside and and it's interesting because there are probably people who want to feel as close to god as 
um, those who can afford to dress modestly and, um, and, you know, might not have the luxury of being able to be, um, you know, to look as pure on the outside as they do on the inside, you know, those that struggle with severe poverty and things like that. So why should that person be damned, um, you know, just because they can't appear Um, you know fully clothed and and washed and bathed and 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 that's that type of thing um to condemn somebody because of their physical appearance um you know and and the same goes for you know the boys can take their tops off at the lake but the women have to stay fully clothed and and they have to make sure that they wear swimsuits with non-white clothes over the top of those swimsuits to preserve their modesty to stop the men from you know, to, to make sure that they don't lead the men's thoughts astray. But why should that be the women's responsibility? Um, Genuinely so never that it was double standard. It just like seemed like it was logical to me. And they were just like, yeah, that's how boys' brains work. And this is how girls' brains work. And I was just like, you're right, my brain, I can like control myself. So I guess that's how my brain works. That checks yeah. out in the truth. It's just interesting because it's mostly, it's predominantly men throughout history who have taken the scripture and interpreted it the way that it is um, practiced yep. today. So uh, that's, I, I don't know, I, I suppose that's why I find it interesting to always go back to. But uh, if you were to give any advice to people who were thinking of moving away from Pentecostalism or any other type of high control group, um what what types of things might you tell them um I mean it's hard because I think we're not taught to it almost is like maybe selfish or bad to be like is this beneficial to me that's self-centered because that's what I'm just like you know what I'm realizing this is not this line of thinking or this these verses or these services that I'm attending early on Sunday morning, they're just like not helping me really, if I'm being honest. Um, but I mean, if you have doubts, like I think it's I think it's okay to go on a journey and ask questions and see where you end up. And like, that should be a safe thing for anybody to do. And if you're not allowed to, then I think that's a problem that... <laughs> maybe that's something to think about you know like uh we shouldn't be forced to believe in something and not be allowed to think about it I guess so yeah for me I just had to ask ask myself is this help is this beneficial to me and I just was like you know this is actually making me feel guilty about myself even though I've always been a really good kid I've not been like the super difficult, super rebellious type of a person. I've been pretty chill yet. I've been told my whole life to like check my heart for rebellion and hatred and all these things that are just not happening. Um, but yet I'm like supposed to have a problem with them. I don't know. <laughs> um, so letting, letting things go, checking out what's in, what's in that bath water, like, do you have to throw the baby out in the bathwater? But maybe just like look what's in there and see if there's anything you could throw out. I don't know <laughs> um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> no, I think it does. I think it's um, I think it's an, a nice perspective to have, and I think it's good advice to give as well. I mean, you spoke about that moment of clarity and freedom that you had when you decided to take that step. Um, And I think for anybody who is wondering whether it is worth it to go through shunning or shaming or, or any of those things to move away from their high levels of control group um, just for that cathartic experience in itself. um, I would say that it is, um, you know, you've got to have that moment where you realize that everybody is equal and deserves to be loved um and um I think just to be able to have that experience and have a heart that is pure and accepting and not judgmental and you know and not searching yourself for um potential sinful thoughts and not searching yourself for your shortcomings in the eyes of God is surely an experience that everybody is entitled to yeah yeah 
yeah and I'm sure it's hard for some people who have like really conservative families or they're really deep in it and there's not like an it's not maybe feeling as safe for them to explore that so I mean I I want to be compassionate to that situation but yeah I mean I definitely feel so much more free so much happier I'm able to like uh the yeah just even like I'm still learning how to not like gaslight myself and like learning it's okay to like have a boundary or to like speak up when something's wrong and like that's okay for me because I didn't realize I was being kind of taught to always feel very negative and like check yourself first and like make sure you're you really like turn myself kind of into a doormat is how I was kind of raised almost um and and realizing how that's really negatively affected me as an adult to this day where people can take advantage of me or relationships get weird and controlling because I can't say what I think or whatever yeah just yeah well, I think I've gone through all of my points here. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to you, April, in case you think there's anything we've missed. I think we talked about everything. I guess I didn't talk a lot about my dad. I could revisit that maybe. But yeah, I, definitely. Yeah. Because um, that was a big revelation that I had coming out uh, or, or asking myself these questions is like growing up with one saved parent, you know, according to the church and like one unsaved parent and being kind of told my whole life that because my dad's not saved, he's, he can't know right from wrong. He can't be a moral person. He, and you know, I would, I would kind of look for it as a kid. And as a teenager, I would like be like, is he cheating on my mom secretly with his secretary? And like, is he like secretly getting up in the middle of the night and watching porn downstairs, like on his phone? I don't know. Like I would be like wondering these like things, these like sneaky things that maybe he was doing, even though he was like, always like super chill, cool guy. Like he didn't really like swear. He didn't drink. He was like very fair, honest, you know, his, I'm not seeing evidence in real life of him being these things but because the church is telling you them every day or whatever like I'm just like that's probably true I just need to look for it I just need to be worried about it and like pray for him to get saved pray for him you know I had nightmares that he was going to hell um and I would cry about it and I'd be like that sucks because my dad's gonna one day like be in hell and be so confused and lost and he's never gonna be able to get out and he's gonna be tortured for the rest of his life and I would just imagine him like kind of helpless which is such it was that was what really upset me like how helpless he was and he was my dad and I would never be able to like explain anything to him or talk to him again like that's so fucked up like to teach a child and for me to like think for most of my life and like adults to this day there's adults who are like how's your dad doing is he is he you know still praying for him to like know the lord and I'm like yeah I guess so yeah I mean (laughs) it's 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 scary that a a child would have those fears and thoughts but it's also a shame that it jeopardized the relationship that you could have had with your father because as you said he never gave you any reason to think that he would be doing these sinful things that the church said uh, wildly people may be doing, um, you know, those who haven't been saved or those who haven't found God. Um, I, I wonder if he felt that as well. I wonder if he felt the distance or the, or the scrutiny. Um, I it's interesting. It. I wonder that too, because I remember once for Father's Day, it was my idea. I was the oldest and I was like very passionate about like, we got to get my dad saved. And, uh, with this one, like father's day, we, um, made signs that said like, Jesus loves you. And like all these like Jesusy things. And we put them like anywhere that we thought he might look. So we put them like on the TV and on his favorite chair and on the stove and in his favorite like pan where he makes eggs for breakfast and whatever. And like, so then we went to church and we were hoping like while he was getting up and everything, cause he didn't come to church with us, that he would like be inspired to like get saved or something like, it's so silly. 
I remember once also, I was like, we have to set an extra seat at the table for Jesus. And I was like, kind of doing it as like a witness to my dad to be like, I believe in Jesus. And like, you should too. Even though, but it was like the most ridiculous thing. It was like an empty seat with an empty plate. And I was like, dad, this is where Jesus is sitting. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, Cause he's always with us. Right. <laughs> Just like, yeah. But yeah, I think you should definitely have a conversation with him. I wonder what he, cause he's probably got some memories and some things that he experienced that you don't recall. Like how that affected, like if he just was like, oh, silly kids, silly wife, whatever. Or if he was yeah. like, it kind of sucks that like my whole family thinks I'm going to hell. Like if that ever like was that something he even worried about, or if he just thought we were silly and he was just like, whatever, I don't believe in this stuff. It's not real. And he yeah. never let it um, I don't know. I think you should definitely, I suppose it'd be easier to approach the subject with him than it would be to, to speak to your, um, your mum potentially. Yeah, door with him than with my mom, I think. I think I'm just also afraid my mom's going to get like weird about it or emotional about it or something. And yeah. I deal with that. Like, <laughs> but yeah, I could probably talk to my dad and have like a chill conversation with him without much drama. You should do that. And then you should write us up a report and tell us how it goes. And if he remembers any other funny things you did that you, that you'd forgotten about. Okay. I can do, I can, that could be my assignment. Then That'd I can good. do an, a short update episode for the listeners and let them know uh, <laughs> April spoke to her father and this was the outcome. Okay. I would love for people to get that invested. <laughs> Well, I've gone through all of my points, April. So I'm going to say thank you so much for joining me tonight. I have been amused, entertained, horrified, enthused, and all the emotions that come with listening to the tales that people come and tell me. Um, I think you're very brave to have taken the step that you've taken um, and I think the positives that have come from that decision clearly show um, you're a very smiley bubbly approachable person uh, so thank you so much for trusting me with your story and for just coming and telling me your experiences today yeah absolutely thank you for reaching out to me and I love to share it's helpful for me too so I hope it helps other people yeah absolutely and if anybody ever wants any advice or support or is thinking about leaving a movement themselves there is the ex-pentecostal subreddit that mm -hmm. is full of wonderful people that share their stories um, and plenty of advice on there on next steps to take if you are thinking about doing the same so thank you very much april i hope you enjoy the rest of your day yes you too thank you take care that is the end of this week's episode if you'd like to you can find more exclusive content on my patreon also if you'd like to get in touch you can do so by emailing me at coltvoltpodcast at gmail.com or find me on twitter and instagram at coltvoltpod I'm your speaker, Casey, and this has been the Cult Vault.